dollars, and less than 5% is handled by REITs. The rest is privately owned by large institutions. And in 1933, one year before TV was invented, the Securities Act excluded commercial real estate as a private offering from a public offering. Okay? Because you couldn't solicit openly investors, accredited or not, to participate in single assets in commercial real estate. One uh, could argue that commercial real estate in large metropolitan areas like Manhattan would be the prime real estate in the world. I don't know if you guys can tell me what is better and what has a more predictable cash flow than commercial real estate in Manhattan. I don't know, that's the research that we have done, but anybody here could tell me that it isn't the best asset class there is? No? Okay, we thought so. So, <laughs> the problem, you know, when we were preventing the smaller investors from incurring into fraud was that we decided to exclude them from the asset class entirely. That's how we were protecting the smaller investor from fraud. So for 80 years and three generations, they didn't have access to this asset class on a single asset, other than going through a REIT, which is a whole different conversation. So that little guy, now, after September 23rd, 2013, has access to single assets of his choosing in the real estate capital of the world. That, to me, is going to change everything. And that is only one piece. Effectively, crowdfunding gives access to people that didn't have it before. When everybody's in a very low yield environment, the portfolio, not only in the States, but around the world, is composed essentially by stocks, bonds, commodities. <laughs> and to us, this is the creation of a whole new asset class. When you talk about diversifying your portfolio, wouldn't you want to put 10 or 15% in commercial real estate? And if it was properly handled by a third-party fund administrator to ensure transparency, risk mitigation, and avoiding fraud entirely, wouldn't that be ideal? Wouldn't that help us solve the bubble that, for example, we see every seven years in Miami, where I used to live before moving to New York seven years ago? Why are all these guys from overseas buying condos? Because they don't have access. We call them speculators. All they want to do is preserve their capital in the safety of real estate in the United States. That's it. They want to buy to rent. The problem was that the asset class wasn't the right one. It wasn't residential. But somebody with $100,000, $50,000, and then we have the whole discussion about accredited and non-accredited investor. We can have that too. But the guy with one hundred thousand dollars, what is that? What, you know, his options are essentially buying an apartment in Naples, rented by somebody from Bolivia. You know, competing against another five hundred guys doing exactly the same thing. Now he has access to what Mr. Bloomberg likes to buy. So, in a nutshell, that to us is the sum of the access that crowdfunding provides. Now, the second important component is that. Real estate is a long-term play, and, and the traditional equity financing in our minds is a short-term play. So just to give you an example, the Vidi Bagata project that we're doing in downtown Bogota, it is, there hasn't been a skyscraper in Colombia for 40 years. This one, you know, is the first one going up, because developers wouldn't venture down there to put $50 million in equity, a 9% in pesos on the senior, probably 15 or 16 on the junior. And then, you know, with all the capital going back to the United States and the emerging markets not doing so well, with the urban density going huge. There are over 500 cities now with over a million people when there were only 12 in the 19th century. In Bogota itself, they live 10 million people and 1.7 working downtown and they live everywhere else. But developers don't want to venture doing a skyscraper in downtown because of what I just explained. So they're much better off doing 10 buildings, six stories high each one, creating a huge problem and defining the city like a big pancake or better like an arepa down there <laughs> than, than, than doing what has to be done. So crowdfunding 
enables the population to effectively invest in the solution of their own needs for a profit. And that to us, you know, levels up the playing field. So those two things are the key components for us in real estate. So we have like five minutes for questions. Uh, so, uh, Christine. Thank you for coming today. Um, I wanted to echo a, a comment that Charlie brought up earlier about control. Um, as a real estate developer, how do you think about follow-on funding for potential surprises, whether it's a budget overrun or a surprise capex, or maybe it's even good news money that you have an unexpected tenant who shows up at your door? Two ways. The first thing is that, and that applies not only to that issue, but also to everything. Uh, crowdfunding in Colombia has been happening for the past, for over 20 years, you know, it's no, no interest, you know, and it started off necessity because developers started uh, uh, syndicating equity directly and then, you know, obviously there was fraud. So what happens is that the government imposed the participation of a third party fiduciary, is how it's called over there, which is essentially a professional fund administrator to create backstops and protect, you know, the investors. So in order to anticipate situations like those, you need to first clearly define that the model doesn't alter the underlying asset itself. You're providing access to not only the returns or the underlying asset, but also the risks associated with that asset. You know, and and uh, and um, you just got to make the same provisions that you would normally make in a traditional development scheme. I don't know if that answers your question. So does the third party administrator uh, maintains control? Who, who makes the decisions, I guess? You have, it's a, you have, you're the sponsor, let's say that you're the developer, and, uh, and uh, you create in a negotiated conversation, you know, with the fiduciary company, certain backstops and provisions. For example, you determine that the money from the, from the, from the crowd can only go in escrow until you reach the break-even point to ensure completion of the project, number one. You need to have a certain capital in, of your own uh, 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 company in, in play, just to protect them as well. You cannot have, for, for example, tie up money from, from the crowd at stake. Um, you need to have a third party uh, uh, builder, a GC, you know, brought up and approved by the third party fiduciary as well. Related parties is a huge issue as well. So my concern, and just to wrap up, I know that we're running out of time, is that fraud is my biggest concern because down there in Colombia, the fiduciary model effectively ensures, you know, the transparency in that conversation that you have between the sponsor and the crowd. Here, people can start raising funds and literally put, put it, you know, in their operating accounts, which is crazy. Susan? Yeah, well, I had a related question. I think what Christine was also asking is, what happens if you have to go back to the crowd and ask for more money? Um, and that's part of my question as well, which is, how has this structure, um, apart from all of the uh, secure aspects that you've described, um, informed the kind of capital structure that you feel comfortable with? Do you, there's always an opportunity for a cost overrun or for things to change or whatever. So are you finding yourself raising, doing this on an all equity basis? Uh, it may be hard to get straightforward debt. Are you raising three times the amount of equity just so you have a reserve to account for this? So how, how has this impacted the way in which you've structured these deals? Very good point. To wrap up your, your, your initial question, you would just go back to the investors as well, mm -hmm. just as if you had any other set of investors. That's what I meant, you know, that the structure of the development deal doesn't really change by the model substantially. <coughs> so technology now allows you to do so. And going to your point, it really depends on the local situation. For example, we just closed on a project in Manhattan that is $120 million. We, the acquisition was 60. We came in with $6 million of our own money, and then we raised $24 million in what we call red equity, which is the ticket, it's a real estate participation in six countries under Reg S, which is an exemption. And then the $30 million were provided by CIBC at Diver Plus Two. So in New York, it makes sense to get leverage because the rates are so low that in addition, you give, you're giving access to the smaller investor to something that he doesn't have, which is cheap credit. In Colombia, that doesn't make sense at all. So we, we do this skyscraper all cash. We already have over 4,200 investors put up more than close to $200 million now for that project. So unfortunately, we're out of time, and I'm not tenured yet, so you know, building. <laughs> <laughs>